Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and seeing all your fine people here this morning. I'm very excited because this is one of my favorite, stop, favorite uh, topics to talk about. The multiple intervention in the ICU, are they worthwhile? So what I'm going to talk about today is what do we know? Some mixed results from my randomized control trial, some challenges in, in mixed interventions, and some perspectives. As you can see here, this is a table of 10 randomized control trials with a mix of interventions. The only two studies who have a positive effect started early in the ICU. This indicates that early-based ICU intervention might be effective, but intervention starting after ICU might not. But therefore, the Medical Research Council recommends to look at patient experiences to, to explain the results from randomized control trial. We should look at patient's experience too. So this table is about what patients talk about and experience of following up. And what you can see, we have an integrative review of 17 studies who strongly suggest that follow-up is... Uh, uh, patients are uh, satisfied with this intervention. And we have two qualitative studies here. They they found that this service is valued, but some people have more benefit of it than others, and some feel abandoned if they don't get this service offered. Ramsey did a study where they combined qualitative studies, uh, qualitative uh, data with quantitative data on patient satisfaction, and found that the service was highly valued, and there was concordance between the quantitative and the qualitative data set on patient satisfaction. So they found that patient in the survey was satisfied, and they could explain more in depth with patient's quotes on it. And that's why I want to give you an example from my PhD. We conducted this rapid study, a randomized controlled trial, and embedded a qualitative piece in it. The aim was to test the effectiveness of a post-ICU recovery on physical and mental health-related quality of life, sense of coherence, anxiety, depression, and PTSD, including healthcare utilization one year after ICU discharge compared to standard care. It was a non-blinded to our parallel group, <coughs> random, pragmatic randomized controlled trial conducted at 10 ICUs in Denmark. We recruited a patient who received mechanical and ventilatory support for 48 hours or longer. We included in total 386 patients, and the intervention consisted of patient photographs during ICU stay, three follow-up consultation versus standard care. And standard care was light sedation, early mobilization, and no following up. But also, all patient was offered physical, re physical rehabilitation if it was ordered by a doctor. <coughs> Our primary outcome was health-related quality of life. So what did we find? We didn't find any differences between group at 12 months or at three months. We measured this on the two health component scores. And when we do that, there's a risk of missing specific effectiveness on the age scale of the short form 36 as we did, as we used as measurement. So therefore, as you can see here, the eight scales, and we didn't find any differences between groups. The red lines are the standard care, and the blue lines are the intervention at three and 12 months. 
so therefore we found in some scales for example physical uh, the role physical scale there was room for improvement but this intervention had no effect on that outcome so in conclusion there was no beneficial or demental effectiveness found on either primary or secondary outcome. Danish patients surviving ICU have a relatively decent life after 12 months with high score on mental component score, on quality of life, a strong sense of coherence that is strongly associated to quality of life and less, ex le less anxiety and depression compared to other studies. But is this all effectiveness or what I say? Therefore, we embedded a qualitative piece in it with the aim to describe the patient experience of ICU recovery from a longitudinal perspective by analyzing follow-up consultation at three time points. Our data collection was patient photographs, as you can see here, patient's trajectory during the ICU stay, and semi-structured interviews of three consultation. We included 12 patients and had 36 consultations. And what we found was in this fundamental storyline is a movement towards a new orientation over here. The basic structure a three illness narrative consisted of three stages. The first stage at two months here was the patient at death door. The most important thing was surviving, but also the acknowledgement of being in mortal danger. At three to at four to five months, the patient was not not um, still not out of the woods. It meant that they had fear of relapse, but still trying to move forward towards recovery. And at the end of the recovery, the patient uh, gone to recovery to reach the, this new orientation. But there was three potential outcomes on the road to recovery, the progressive, the steady state and the downhill recovery. So we have three patient groups actually. And our conclusion was this provides an understanding of the process of recovery after intensive care from a longitudinal patient perspective. But how can we look at this in a mixed model. Is this the effect? As I said before, we looked at the quantitative piece and we didn't find any effectiveness. We looked at the qualitative piece and found spontaneously quotes from patients that stated, all that I needed was someone who took care of me in the process. Nobody else has contacted me. Actually, I think it helped me because I realized something that I wouldn't have thought about. I had a feeling of a caring person who took me seriously. That was good. Another patient said, I have gained an insight into many things and recognized my values that I didn't before. I was very happy at the first consultation and get my photographs and that. It was comforting and nice to know that some people do come back after such an experience. And another said it was a strong experience to be so far out and back again, especially when I got back so well. That has been good to talking to you. So in conclusion, we can say the quantitative piece didn't find any difference, but we did find some signs of effectiveness. There was the confirmation and information was valued from patients. Resolving the jigsaw puzzle gave the patient a sense of coherence and an understanding of their experiences. 
it was beneficial for patients to share the experience. So if you look at these two data sets and compare them, there is a discordance between them. So how can that be? Maybe did we talk about what was most important for patients? As you can see here, again, we have the qualitative and quantitative piece, and patient from the intervention and control group stated what was most important for them to be alive and be happy for one's life. I'm alive, and, uh, and I'm alive still. When you have been seriously ill, you have some good days, and for a few days you are down. If you feel bad, I'm up again anyway. The control group stated it was close. I know that the fact that I'm being here today and I do have back pain, it doesn't matter because I'm alive and I'm glad, I'm happy for it. My health could be better. I was readmitted to the hospital again. Otherwise, it's very good. Some days are significantly better than others. There are different days. And in the quant qualitative piece, uh, quantitative piece, we didn't find any of these variations. So both groups seem to appreciate life, even though some days are better than others. There's a confirmation that there's no difference between the two groups in the, in the statement over here. But did we measure what was most important for patients? There was discord discordance between patients' experience and what we actually did measure in the SF6 SF36 scores. Therefore, when you look at how actually you can conceptualize health-related quality of life, we measured SF6 SF36 as two component scores. And we had two indicators of health-related quality of life. The general dimension in health-related quality of life is general physical and psychological health, but also sexual and social functioning. Some of this is not captured in SF36. You could also measure other indication, not only symptoms, but also existential questions like why me? well-being and satisfaction. There's a study from Lim looking at validating SF36. She did a cognitive interview to see what people understand of the questions, and she found that survivor's health status and the impact on this on quality of life, that physical, emotional, cognitive status was, of course, important, but it was also a life-changing experience people had had. In conclusion, there were significant gaps between generic measurements and patient-based conceptualizing health-related quality of life. And why is that? Why do people actually do that? We have this response shift theory meaning that patients adapt to their situation. After a while, a patient adapts to a new situation and get new values and, and uh, change their internal standard and, in cha and change their conceptualizing of how health-related quality of life is in their life. Therefore, this is an explanation on how we perceive health-related quality of life and even have a relatively good quality of life when we experience something really, really terrible. Yeah. And what can we do about that? We have to look at how do people and patients conceptualize their health-related quality of life, but also what kind of intervention do we do? How do we map our aim towards our outcome measures. How do we do that? How do we think our intervention work or not work? Are we, do we have consensus about important outcomes and instruments? In the development phase, I think we should look at how people actually define the most important thing for them 
we have an aging population in the ICU, patient is changing. The instruments are maybe way long back and we need to reevaluate them and evaluate them again. There's this promising item bank, this computer adaptive test, so you can get some inspiration from, but this need to be, this is the future, so to speak, but we need to translate them, validate them again. We could also look at another website called Improving Long-Term Outcomes and look at core outcome measurement set. Do we have consensus about that? And there are some guidelines here and what you need to measure in these different outcome measures. But we could also look at specific health-related quality of life or follow-up measurements as we're going to hear some more about from my colleague. That's going to be very exciting too. But just to summarize this, multiple intervention in the ICU, are they worthwhile? Yes, I do think they are worthwhile, but we cannot only see effectiveness as randomized controlled trial and outcome measures that are perhaps outdated because our patient population has a different, different view of their life, a different perspective. They are more, they have more comorbidities and stuff like that. So we have to adapt those instruments too. So yes, I think they are worthwhile and we cannot ignore the patient's voice in this. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, we should have said in the beginning that you're free also to put questions through through the app. Uh, that I will not explain now, but it's part of the Congress. Are there any open questions from the floor? Well, let's have a small discussion. Uh, Jeanette, you are now working in your postdoc period as a research nurse and you're developing evidently tools to analyze the quality of life of patients. Now, what is your um, impression? I'm now going back to the simple intervention that you described and the very complex analysis that, that you used. How should we perceive the result of small, very simple interventions when the patient expresses him or herself to judge the effect of that? Should we focus on the patient story or should we make a judgment ourselves on the quality of, of the, the effect? I think you should do both. I think you should have your measurements and then you should ask the patient and then combine the results, actually compare them. Yes, I mean, uh, it's self-evident that we should focus on the patient, but what I see is that all these instruments they are uh, that are used so far are putting through questions on which we put our own values. So yeah. I think it's very important this mix, uh, sorry this transition model that you are um, talking about. What is your your impression of, of the the difference between the patient perspective and and the care perspective on the, the outcome? Uh, we're doing a an interview study of the nurses in the rapid study to see what effect has it on them. And I can reveal here, no published data, but, but um, they do value it because they have information from patients that they can use in clinical practice. So they can actually improve clinical practice based on what they learn in the consultations. So that's a pretty fine outcome, I think, even though it's not the most strong evidence, but it is a statement from nurses. Mm -hmm. yes. I have a, an, another question. Uh, when you perform follow-up interventions, rehab, if you would like to call it this intervention, rehabilitation, it is always a problem um, to have the control group uh, to have no follow-up at all because you have to do this test for the 
control group as well. Mm. So in a way, they p get some kind of follow-up at three months and 12 months mm. when you perform the screening of those patients. How do you think that influenced on that you did not see any difference between the two groups, that both groups actually received a follow-up? Um, many patients, I, I had all the contact to the control group at three and 12 months with the questionnaires. And many patients called me at three months talking to me about what is this study about? Did I sign this? W what do you want me to do? I didn't remember anything of the screening at the, f at the beginning because we screened them too at the beginning to allocate patients and randomize them. So I don't think it has so much influence because they don't remember it very much in detail. Some of them don't. But it has an influence. Mm. And you cannot ignore that. Mm. But Be Because it's important that those yeah. groups have received. So the uh, difference have to be very large if it's... Yeah. Yeah. Another question that I have was that the role physical, it was not so good values for none of the groups. And role physical, you can say, is one of the most important, the role physical and role emotional, because that is social participation, that is actually a consequence of the other uh, areas. Do you have some own suggestions on how should we increase role physical for these patients that was not included in your studies, just some no. kind of perception of what could we do? I think we should look at the continuity of care and the coordination of care th throughout the whole study. Many of the patients, 70% of the patients got rehabilitation in the hospital, but only 30% of them got rehabilitation, specialized rehabilitation afterwards. Maybe we should try to look at specialized rehabilitation program for complex critical ill patients instead of thinking that we could adopt the same programs on critical illness from lung and heart and cancer diseases. Maybe we should develop something specific, individualized for those patients. Thank you. And thank you. There, I think there is a question. Uh, yeah, one more question, yeah. sorry. <laughs> so it looked like from your results that um, Danish critical care survivors enjoyed a decent quality of life. Um, as well as low levels of mental illness, anxiety, etc. Why do you think this is different than other studies from North America, etc.? Do you think it's the social support system you'll have over here or the coping mechanisms? W what's sort of the difference uh, that you feel that your results are from some of the other literature? <coughs> it is, I think it's some of the, the social system, but it's also that it, it's maybe a phrase, I don't know, but Danish patient and the population in Denmark are a very happy people. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's that, I don't know. Right, thank you. <laughs>